Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making, and now they're applying that same obsession to professional grade artist panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. Scott Connery is a painter living in Portland, Oregon. After graduating from the Rhode Island School of Design with a degree in illustration, Scott worked as a designer and illustrator. Painting had always been a part of his life, but after the birth of his daughter Jane, he left his design and illustration clients behind and made the decision to dedicate his career to fine art. As you undoubtedly know, the consequences of this decision often brings instability. It can be a tough commitment for any artist, and as Scott will tell you, making this commitment requires a very special kind of stubbornness and dedication. But Scott's story has a lot more to it. It has a little girl named Jane, and Jane is a little bundle of laughter and hugs. She is, of course, at the center of her parents' being. We talk a lot about Jane in this episode because her story shapes everything about Scott. Jane was born with a rare heart disease. She had the first of many surgeries when she was only eight days old. None of these surgeries came with guarantees or certainty. So this episode is as much about Scott and his family as it is about his art. And I'll be honest, there were some tough moments in this conversation. I had questions I didn't really know how to ask or if I should even be asking them. But as Scott points out, there are other families experiencing similar or worse situations, which is exactly why his story needs to be heard. Scott is exceedingly gracious and candid throughout this conversation. He shares his story so that other parents facing similar struggles know that they're not alone, and he shares it with a sincere hope that it is somehow helpful. Here is Scott Connery. Scott, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I really, really appreciate the time you are taking to talk with me, and I'm excited to have you on the show. It is my pleasure. Tell me a little bit about when you started painting, specifically when you decided that this was going to be your vocation and you were throwing all your chips in, for lack of a better term. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I I don't have an easy answer because it's sort of... You know, I've been a a late bloomer, but I've been blooming for a long time. You know, there's sort of, I I was the kid that was always drawing, but I didn't know almost until I went to art school whether or not I was going to be going to the arts or going to the sciences. And then I went to art school to be an illustrator. I wasn't going to be a painter. And then, you know, as the the careers meander, I ended up doing some design and, and such and realized that that was, Scott as a designer is a bit like Michael Jordan as a baseball player. And I don't mean to say that I have the skills of, you know, the painting skills of the equivalent of Michael Jordan as a basketball player, but it was, it was definitely, I was not a designer by nature. I'm not a designer by nature. And then with some big hiccups and challenges in our life, the last years with our little girl, and I'd been painting the whole time, but with, after she was born and we got through sort of the, the darkest of the storm, I realized that I cannot be the parent to a child with special needs, keep any design clients happy to help keep the bills paid, and also push a painting career and work as a painter. So I said goodbye to that, and it's been painting nonstop since as time and life and other constraints allow. Wow. Sounds like there was a lot going on, obviously, emotionally with a new person in the family and then special needs. Can you tell me a little bit, if it's not too much to ask, what it felt like to, I mean, dedicating yourself to art as a painter isn't exactly the most stable thing in the world. How did you feel? What was going through your head when you made that decision? So I I get asked often, like, what did our experiences in the hospital and with, with our amazing daughter, what did that do to painting, to my work? And my usual answer is that it made it insignificant. But I... I tend to be a very obsessive person who has one thing that he wants to do. And I just, there was no way that I was going to be able to do all these different things all at the same time. And I, I remember, (laughs) I remember sitting in my living room, actually a friend's living room, because we're remodeling our house at the same time, holding my daughter. And I'm talking to my mother who was visiting and trying to help out through some tough times. And I've got 
tears coming down my face. And I'm telling her, I, I don't want to be that person who 30 years from now says, now I get to finally do this thing. And I, I just, it's, it's been very hard. As you know, this is a rather ridiculous way to, to make a living. It is an absurd compulsion, but it's, it's what I've done for to, you know, sometimes it's not as much, it's not what I've necessarily done 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week every week since graduating college, but it's what I've always done. And I couldn't imagine not doing it, but I always, I sort of, and I'm meandering a little bit on this, but I, what I did when I made that decision as best I could, as we sort of extracted ourselves out of, again, the worst of the storm, at least temporarily, is I sort of set a deadline and I did what I could with some help of family and friends and what we still had left and gathered some resources and said, okay, I'm going to give myself these number of months to get some work done. And then when I get to that deadline, if, if we can still pay the mortgage, all right, I'm going to give myself another chunk of months. And I sort of just keep pushing the deadline a little farther ahead. And it's been a, it's been a bit of a slog. Yeah. But that's, you know, it's not a, in the grand scheme of things. And as I say, like the, how our experiences have made the paintings and the career it sometimes seem very insignificant. The other side is as much as we can get so caught up in our angst and oh, how I can get caught up in the angst, nobody's going to die if I make a bad painting. Right. This is in fact, uh, again, however much a luxury and however much of a, a normal human thing it is to do to tell stories with paintings or whatever creative endeavor. No, it is still a luxury to some extent. Yeah, it is. And, and I think, yeah, that's, a, that's a, such an interesting conversation, like the luxury of painting, because you have to sort of assume that a certain number of your needs are met and you're willing to tolerate or put up with the instability that comes with it. Because I think in the back of your head, in the back of our heads, we must be certain enough that we're not going to starve and that nobody's going to die if we do this. And even then. <laughs> Sometimes, as I said, it, it is, as I joke with several friends, that there's a weird stubbornness and almost desperation to most of the artists I know who are successful. Yeah. Like, damn it, I'm going to do this, uh, even if it's not reasonable. Because, I mean, there's so many other reasonable things you can do. This is, and isn't this always the tension of this career, is that on one hand, I am pursuing that impulse and scratching that that itch, whatever that creative urge might be. And on the other hand, I have to pay the mortgage. And this is how we pay the mortgage. Uh, my wife has been a stay-at-home mom with our daughter, because, particularly because of her needs. And this is how we pay the bills. And I, I always joke, try it with a smile that, you know, it's, this is silly. Don't do this <laughs> unless you need to do it. I mean, it's like, I, I'm, I'm sure you've had, you, you meet, I do an open studio tour every year. And invariably every year, somebody comes in and these are actually there's a bunch of stories tied to that, but someone will bring their high school kid in who's interested in pursuing the arts and they want some advice. And there's always that thought in the back of here, like, all right, so do I encourage them? <laughs> Am I blunt with them? Like, do you want to terrify them into, you know, like how, how honest do you, are you? And it, usually I end up just telling them like, sort of what I just said of like, if you need to do this, here are some suggestions and ideas I have on, on how you can do it best. But know that you need to want to do this, that this is not, this is not an easy path. No, and it's definitely, speaking for myself, there is that stubbornness. There's, I refuse to turn back. I refuse to <laughs> consider any other option. <laughs> so this is going to work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I leave no alternatives. <laughs> Isn't that what you do every time you start working on a painting? Like this, this painting is going to be a good painting and it's going to work out. And one of the challenges is to recognize when a painting is not working and to go, okay, I don't let the stubbornness get in the way of making a wise choice about a particular piece. Ooh, okay. We're going to dive into that. But first, I want to I want to hear what you tell those high school students after you've decided to qualify it with, if this is what you really need to do, son. <laughs> That's almost actually the sum total of it is to just ask themselves, you know, is this what you really want to do? Recognize, and especially, you know, what it's been 20 some years since I went to college and I was very fortunate to have very supportive parents who were able to foot the bulk of the bill. They just really need to recognize whether or not this is something they want to do and, and point them to various different paths that are available, whether it's ateliers or going to, it's so strange that we call 
a place like Rhode Island School of Design, where I went, a traditional art school, when, of course, the atelier is certainly much more of the tradition. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was just trying to make sure that they have a, a wider sense of what's out there. And almost invariably, I find out that they know so much more about their options than I certainly knew, whatever that was, 27 years ago. Yeah. Wait, how old, how old am I? Oh, my goodness. Okay. 28? Uh, yeah, I'm 28 <laughs> years old, clearly. It's, it's been a rough 28 years, uh, you know, but yes. So would you give different advice? Maybe the better way to ask this question is, given that that would be the advice that you would give to, let's say, a high schooler, what advice would you give to someone who is, let's say, two months away from graduating from said traditional art school or finishing up their time in an atelier? I usually would tell them, I mean, it, it's split in a couple of ways. I mean, there's a sort of the nuts and bolts advice you'd give for how they would manage the career and the choices in that career. And then there's the nuts, the choices that they should make, at least that I'm interested in making in terms of how to make the artwork and how I might suggest that they go forward with what they're, they're making. From the sort of nuts and bolts point of view of the career, it's, it's the old school stuff and not the stuff that I'm always good at. I, I should be <laughs> clear. I, you know, I, I've learned a lot of things the, the wrong way and will continue to learn things the wrong way of that it takes a long time. What's the old Miles Davis quote of something effective? You have to play for a long time before you can play like yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there's this frantic urge to, to get to things, make things happen as fast as possible. And I, and we're all still doing it. I assume that, you know, like today's going to be the day I make great paintings. Today's the day that, that some gallery is going to find me, in a, you know, and everything's going to be just blow up and be beautiful and amazing. And it's like, just plug away, make good work, go into the studio and work as, often as you can, but don't beat yourself up if you're not in there every day. And always try to figure out why you're trying to make any work at all, let alone a particular piece. Mm -hmm. The why, I think that the, the why is so crucial for almost everything, I think. And it gets lost, I think. Yeah. I, I think people, people lose sight of the why, especially as we've, you know, with the resurgence of, at least what feels like a resurgence of representational work, that it just feels like there's so many people so busy trying to find the recipe mm -hmm. that they lose sight of the why is what actually guides the painting. Not that you figured out the exact right pigment to use for your underpaintings. Exactly. What is your why? Well, I, I mean, I sort of talked about it a bit. The story in the paintings these days is very much about, and it's not every single painting, but by and large is about our daughter and our experiences with her and the challenges she's she has faced, we've faced as a family, and and are going to face going forward. You know that trying to recognize whatever the story might be in a particular subject matter, and you know to some extent, I try not to get too caught up in the question of why am I always asking why? <laughs> like, <laughs> Incessant navel gazing. Oh, I I can I can tell you every bit about my navel you've ever wanted to know. Uh, <laughs> there's a vast landscape in that navel. I've been paint doing a whole series of broken eggs and they may have started as a little bit of a joke because I knew it was a, an assignment that is common in the ateliers. There's a, a friend from college, Sadie Valeri runs a, a great atelier down in, in the Bay area. And, and that's, you know, painting eggs is one of those things that one of those assignments that the uh, students have. And I was having a bad day of painting and I said, screw it. I'm going to paint a damn egg. <laughs> And I started working on this egg and I just fell in love with it. And I was actually out of, out of a residency trying to sort of get my head back around this career. And, and again, what we'd been through as a family and what it all meant and you know, trying to put all the, the pieces back together. And, and I'm working on this egg and there's that seam down the middle of this, this cracked thing. And of course, an egg is a complicated object that we have a complicated relationship with. You know, we, we eat them and they're just ubiquitous, but at the same time, they're disgusting. You know, <laughs> got to wash your hands how many times? And you know, let's talk about salmonella and everything else. And, and at the same time, it is an egg. It is life. It's like this little universe. And I've got this painting. I mean, I've got this egg sitting on the surface in front of me, and it's got this split down the middle. And I'm absorbed by this, and I'm trying to figure out what it is about it. And I realize that this seam, and it's, it actually has come up a bunch in my work over the last few years, it reminds me of... The scars that run, my daughter has, she's had three open heart surgeries, among other things. And the scars that run from her 
collarbones down to her belly button. Mm. Well, another navel. <laughs> that seam and that, I know, it's just some of the stuff that rattles through my head as I'm, I'm working on these things. And, I'm, and I try to be mindful of what the story is in something. And that, and if I figure out what the story is, the painting seems to, to guide itself. Mm. And all those, those sort of the more academic questions of light and dark and shadow and composition, they largely sort themselves out mm-hmm. if I understand why I want to make that painting. Interesting. If that makes sense. I've never, well, hmm. I might be looking at it from a different perspective. I'm sure I am. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's. <laughs> but that, I mean, that's an interesting way of, of saying it. What I'm, what I'm thinking, what's going through my head is possibly navel gazing too much into this conversation. But, you know, when you're talking about starting with the why and starting with that piece of it, and then everything else just works itself out. I kind of have as much as I believe in starting with the why, then my assumption is always that the composition, the lighting, et cetera, et cetera, that that is a vocabulary that you already have. And so you can use it without thinking too much about it. So, you know, I'm proficient enough in the English language that I do not have to think at all about grammar when I'm speaking for the most part. So it just comes to me. So I think that from my perspective, it's the, We might be splitting hairs and we're talking about exactly the same thing, but I guess I kind of like have this, this is a chicken and the egg thing. Ha ha ha. (laughs) You know, which is actually coming first. Yeah. And I, I don't, I mean, I certainly think, you know, all that formal stuff. I mean, yes, if you've done this, I've done this enough. I've painted for decades. And so in a sense, which should seem like all that other stuff, you know, what the vocabulary, the tools are all available, but somehow that's still the stuff that, still comes up. I mean, it's still always a bit of a a battle to figure out how to make, get all those things to work the way they need to work. And unless of course I come back to the why of that particular subject. And and as far as the, where do the ideas come from and how do they build to the next idea? And the big thought that's been rattling around my head for, well, it feels like forever now is how do you, how do you bring together the, that impulse, that original idea and the why, and how do you bring in the more intellectual stuff together into a piece rather than just letting it be all impulse, all idea, all Mm -hmm. play and fun and sloppy and loose and all that other stuff. Yeah. To which I usually just say, I like to color. (laughs) Painting's fun. (laughs) Except it isn't, is it? I mean, do do you, do you find painting fun? Ooh, good question. I, I'm going to turn this around on you. Mm. A lot of people have assumptions about a lot of folks who aren't artists. You know, I have people come into the studio during these open studio events, and invariably, uh, there's my favorite word, invariably, people come in and someone says, it must be so wonderful to be in your place of bliss. Yeah. <laughs> or, or something like that. And I just sort of look at them like a dog that's heard a harmonica for the first time. I'm like, huh? what? <laughs> have, have you never met an artist? This is... <laughs> the tortured artist, the tortured soul. It's interesting. I... Because you're making me think about that. I get super excited and have lots of fun at the beginning of a painting, a blank canvas. I get all excited. The lay in, I'm, I'm in that happy place. It's like almost total glee. And then there inevitably comes a time where there are problems that I'm having that are much more difficult to resolve. And then there's like that period of torture. Yes. And then when it's done, it maybe this is like giving birth. I look back and go, that wasn't so bad. That was pretty awesome. I like that. Let's do it again. <laughs> right. But but during that moment, I'm like ripping my hair out. I'm pacing the floor. I'm like giving it dirty looks out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> Why am I doing this? This is absurd. There's, I could be I'm out like, you know. doing X, Y, Z. <laughs> Yes, I thought I knew. I thought I'd figured this out, and and that's the you know as I said the the students that are always you know, they come in and they, they take a workshop or something, and people are always looking for the answer. You know what what's the pixie dust? What's the secret sauce? What's the the shortcut? And you just like it's a marathon. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a marathon, and you don't know if it's going to be a ten mile marathon or I don't realize it. You know, marathon prescribed distance, but you don't know what the distance of this race is going to be, mm-hmm. and you have to sort of find a way to enjoy the just one foot in front of the other. I have just painted a picture of painting as the most unpleasant, arduous, 
<laughs> it is, I, you know, and that's why I, I come back to that, that it is just such a compulsion, you know, that there is, there's this itch that needs to be scratched yeah. and it feels so good to scratch it. But did you really want to have an itch to start with? I, I don't know. I mean, but it's there. And then it won't go away either. Like when you have a bad itch, like now you got me thinking about itching and some of my back itches. Um <laughs> But, you know, like you can, you can scratch it and then it like immediately, like as soon as you take your hand away, it immediately comes back. So it's almost like that with painting that like speaking for myself, started painting, super excited. This is awesome. Run into those problems. Oh my God, this sucks. That's horrible. I'm a terrible artist. Okay. You've done this a million times. You know that this is part of the process. Let's just keep going. Because ultimately if that part of it didn't occur, I don't think I would, I wouldn't be interested in it. It would be so bored. Like if you could give people the magic sauce, if you could give them the formula to do it, how boring would this be? Right. Well, it's, I mean, I, it's usually starts with me complaining and I, I have, it's, it's in my DNA to complain, but there's that, you know, you see the artists on Facebook and these are sort of the, the hazards of social media of you just, you see those folks who seem to paint good paintings, maybe not great paintings, but good paintings every single day. And they just, it just flows out of them like water. And, and it's, and especially when you do couple it with the need to make a product that, you know, you can pay the mortgage with, that it's like, I'm a failure. I'm an imposter. What's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? And I remind myself, I don't always remember this, remind myself that that struggle is part of what makes it so engaging. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's, you know, I, I built the studio I'm in. I helped remodel my house. I, you know, working on these paintings. It's the challenge, the problem solving, the fact that it's not going to work is part of why I want to do it. Mm. I, I hate it. I mean, I hate it. I want it to work every single time. And every single time I make, I not ever, often I make that mistake of thinking this painting is going to be the painting of all paintings. Mm -hmm. It will just, it will be the key to the universe. <laughs> the skies will open and the angels will sing. Oh, and they do. I mean, when it's working, you can just swear you can hear the trumpets in the background. You're like, that is right. I am whatever deity it is that's, that's making this thing happen. And, and then you make the wrong mark. And the painting, you know, you've got the painting 95% done and you just won too many marks. Like, ah, and it just starts fumbling away. And Right. I mean, those all those mindset issues, though, I love them in a way. Like, I, you know, they're, like there's that nerdy intellectual side of me that I'm so fascinated by that. Because when you allow yourself to spiral down, you go into those places that we're just talking about. But if you can, you know, when you are able to distance yourself from it and be a fly on the wall and just watch what's happening, it's pretty amazing, <laughs> you know, what your brain is doing. Because when you can sort of just lose yourself in the painting, and I'm, I'm sure you've had those paintings where time just disappears and, you know, you're in that quote unquote flow state and you lose track of everything. And then all of a sudden there's this amazing painting. Like we could actually be there more often than we think we can. It's just that we make things difficult for ourselves. And I don't, I kind of think I know why, but I don't know if I know why. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't figured out if, if it's, I tend to be somewhat suspicious of that feeling because we, we, we get so confused about, at least I get very confused about when I'm actually getting it right until I'm stepping back and looking at the piece because as you, you mentioned, there's that, you know, the initial start of the painting where it's just so open and there's so many possibilities and isn't this going to be fantastic and, and the color is flowing and this is wonderful. Yeah. But at that point, it's often, it's a little bit like, aren't the clouds great? And you can see all these things in the clouds. You're like, yeah, but let's make it the thing that you're trying to make, make it resonate in a bigger way. And that's that final reach for the brass ring, right? you know, you fail so often. I mean, at least I fail. I make a lot of bad paintings or oh, well, I make a lot of paintings that get scraped down. And Oh, I never do, Scott. Never. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, and that's why, as I said, like the, the, one of the hazards of social media is you see these folks who don't seem to make mistakes. And do they say that or are you assuming that? Well, don't put me on the spot that way. Uh, no, the, uh, <laughs> some, some of it is, I mean, some of it is certainly my assumptions, but it's one of the things that happens in, I'll, if I do a workshop and I'll work on a, a, be doing a demonstration. At some point, I'll wipe it down mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. And they, the students are always like, wait, what, what do you, and I'm like, what? It wasn't working. 
I recognized that it was not working. There's, I have not, this isn't a marriage. I haven't given a vow to this initial sketch that I have. <laughs> it's okay if it, if I decide this isn't going to work out. All right. And critically, I've learned from this and I'm not going to forget all the stuff that I've learned through this initial drawing and, and study and everything else. And people have, there's so much mythology in this field and a lot of the artists, and this is why I will be just openly critical, sell the myth. Yeah. And it infuriates me because it's, you know, like you, now I'm going to rant for a moment. You know, the artists that, that sort of talk about what a privilege it is to be an artist and they're framing it not as, not in a way to ground themselves and recognize the luxury of what they do, but to sort of announce that they are special. I am special. It is mm-hmm. a privilege that you get to see the beauty of who I am. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> this is, people make mistakes. Paintings are often bad, you know, all that stuff. This is, I'm going to stop ranting. No, but I I totally agree with you. And that's, it's easy to both make assumptions and then to fall into other people's guided view of themselves and their art careers. And that's why, you know, like one thing I do love about this podcast is I can like push people and keep asking them questions and kind of like get at the truth. And the, you know, I think one of the patterns that I see is that there is a, I think when people are honest, there's at least a minimum of a 50% quote unquote failure rate in a painting where it's just, yes. it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to go on the fire. It's going to get wiped out. It's going to get painted over. Yes. And let's all just admit that. <laughs> right. Let's admit that. Let's, and also admit that a lot of the stories that we have about, I know there's great painters of centuries before that we've edited out the part where he didn't paint for a year and a half. Right. Because- he was sick or depressed or there was a war going on or whatever it was. Things happen. And that's... Life that's, happens. That's, life happens. And the life that happens is, is part of what the paintings are about. I mean, there are... It's just, again, the mythologies. And it's how much of what gets talked about on Facebook and such is... you know, How many times are we told to, how to work on our branding and our marketing mm-hmm. and such? And I have friends ask me, I sell a fair amount of work through Facebook and my website, and I've made some wonderful contacts through social media. And people ask for advice, like, what is it you're doing differently that seems to be working for you? And my answer is kind of just like, I try to be sincere. Mm -hmm. That's all. You know, if somebody says something nice about a painting, I respond or I try to respond. I'm not always perfect about it, but, you know, I try to be just open about what it is I'm doing and not try to sell some story of the myth of the, you know, the artist in the studio whose genius is flowing from his hands and, you know, all that mumbo jumbo. <laughs> the striped shirt and the beret. Right. Oh, well, you know, I am bald, so I do just wear the hat. It's kind of required. It keeps you warm. Right. I need it. <laughs> it's important. Yes. <laughs> I want to, I would love to hear about your daily ritual. Do you have one? How do you start your, your day? The day is I have a really choppy schedule. I look back to sort of my, my college career and the different professors that I, I worked with. And one amazing professor was Tom Segoros. And Tom was, he just had a very sort of worker approach to painting where he would go to the studio and paint 10 to four every day. And, you know, you, you can't make any shots. You don't take kind of you got to get in there and work. And I tend to be much more spotty where there are days when I, I get up, I have my morning tea, my bagel, whatever, help get the kid out the door and don't manage to get any painting done at all. You know, I'll be in the studio. I'll look around, not manage to get anything done. And then there are days when I'm in the studio, it feels like 30 hours of 24. Mm -hmm. where it's just the obsession has kicked in and I have whatever the subject is, it's got its talons in me and I have to figure it out. How's that for a roundabout answer? (laughs) It's sincere and honest and genuine. (laughs) I try. It's and exactly what we were just talking about, that it's not like, ooh, I work from 7.43 a.m. until blah, 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 you know, but, and people do do that. And I, I think that having a set, for me at least, having a set schedule is is crucial to me because I'm like a squirrel. I'll see something and be like, ooh, shiny or whatever, like a crow, I guess is a better one. You know, like I'll run off and think something is totally amazing or I'll plop on the couch and think I'm going to read for 15 minutes and three hours later, I'm like <laughs> still there. 
Yes. And, you know, and, and my studio is in my backyard and laundry needs doing and mm-hmm. you know, I should clean the studio again. And, uh, you know, I, there's somebody emailed me and I should really get back to them. And, you know, it's so easy to get distracted and sucked in. And I am I'm almost a professional distractor. But I it's like I there was a uh, what's her name? Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Uh huh. Melissa Gilbert. Or Elizabeth, I said Melissa Gilbert. Elizabeth. That's Little House on the yes. Prairie. We're talking about the author. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> the one that wrote the book, she was she was being interviewed and she was asked about her writing at this exact question. And she works a bit more like I do, which just very fits and spurts until something catches and then it just snowballs and runs. And she sort of turned around the I'm trying to remember exactly how she put it, but that whole, you know, it's 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And, mm-hmm. and she's like, no, 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 no. It's 99% oyster, 1% pearl. Uh, <laughs> that it's not necessarily about, for her and not, you know, and it isn't for me, but that there's not some specific ritual that seems to work for everybody in work no. ethic. But, you know, that, that it's, again, for me, it's just whatever seems to to catch my eye enough and allow myself the space to get excited about the painting that it starts turning into a, a daily thing. But I, I take a lot of breaks and step away a lot. And then again, sometimes spend, put in all nighters. Yeah. There was one painting that I think the painting that I'm most proud of, of mine of the last year or two, it was 1am and, and I needed to ship this out the next day for a show, wet or not. It's 1am and I'm like, I just need to figure out this figure. And the next thing I know it's 2am. Like, okay, one more hour. Then it's 3 a.m. Like, okay, one more hour. I think it was 5 or 6 a.m. when I finally stopped because I just... <laughs> because the UPS guy was ringing the doorbell or... <laughs> there was a little bit of that probably, but it was just, I'm like, I'm just going to work on this until it, it is done. And if it's not good enough, I won't send it out. A running joke with some friends who have spent more time doing commercial work than I have is that I tend to, you know, that old idea of Anything worth doing is worth doing right. Mm-hmm. That's not always the practical approach when you're trying to, again, make a product that at some point you're going to sell. That I, I tend to just work on something until I'm happy with it. Whether that's a little five by seven inch painting that shouldn't take forever. Famous last I words. Poured countless hours into, or, you know, it's just, it gets all a little bit absurd. How do you balance that or do you? Because that's a tough one. Yeah, I... I don't know that there's, I mean, it's like the, the question that often gets asked is how do you find a balance in your life at all? And I just, I don't know that there is a balance. You know, the paintings of mine that seem most successful are the paintings that I just, I made the way they needed to be made. And I tend to not get too, and I'm not making anything terribly wild and avant-garde or anything, but I just tend not to worry too much about, try not to worry too much about the finish line on a piece, even though when I started I am invariably thinking how, again, how can I get to the end as fast as possible and have it be great? But that just, that never works. Interesting. I'm thinking about when you said fast as possible, I was just thinking like about the marathon versus the sprint conversation we had earlier. But but I'm also curious given this, I mean, there's a difference between striving for excellence and falling down into the pit of perfectionism where you will never... <laughs> Ever, right. ever get out. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. I have not found a balance there that I know of. I mean, I know I'm not making perfect paintings, so I, I don't have to, I shouldn't worry too much about perfection. I just, I work until the painting tells me it's done. And maybe it tells me it's, it's not exactly right, but until it, it just, I don't, until I can't make it any better. There's a, a painting I did recently, and there's, it's a little different from some of the other stuff I've, I've done. And then there's the way I've handled some edges and some tonal shifts and stuff. Like, there are things I should do to it to make it a Scott painting to finish it, but I, I can't make it any better. So it's done. And it didn't take me 800 hours, which right. is wonderful. <laughs> finding that balance and finding the answer to when is the itch scratched, especially when there are so many other distractions in life that, and things that do consume time. Well, I guess maybe it comes back to that, you know, to that, the start of the painting, which is the why you know, when you've answered that question, then do you feel like you can let other things go? Not always, certainly. Should we let it go? Should I let it go? Yes, <laughs> without a doubt. I mean, it, when it's, again, working representationally, there's there seems to be, there's sort of expectations. I mean, there's expectations of any painting, but, you know, working representationally, like, does this look like a thing in a space? Does it have space and, you know, form and all that stuff? Does it... Do you believe it's an egg? Yeah, do you believe it's an egg? And I have to remind myself that 
something feels real when it's compelling is not necessarily related to me having taken all the steps that that my habits tell me I should take. You look at a, a Basquiat painting and it can sing and resonate in a way that to me a Rubens never does or almost never does. Uh-huh. Even though that Rubens is of course a masterful creation. I mean, you know, obviously the better comparison being the, you know, say Saturn devouring his son, the you know, famous the Goya versus the Rubens is you know like all that that stuff, does it feel real? Does it have all that the the appropriate decoration of realism? Does that really matter? Only so far as it answers that initial question of why. Mm-hmm. How was that for? Beautiful, Scott. Naval gazing. <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time in my studio by myself. Yes, I do. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> we hope. Hopefully we do. We yes. <laughs> yeah. It always ends up coming back to, as I said, my, our experiences with our daughter. And it's just, it's turned things around a lot. And I'm, I'm, still, I'm still coming to terms with what all that means. And I'm not sure I have, I haven't figured out that answer yet. And I, I doubt I ever will. I think about any of the artists that I, who were influential on me, whose work I enjoy and the, the, whose work I find compelling. And it's almost always that it's just that perpetual cycle of neurotic curiosity and obsession and trying to figure it out and, and changing things. Mm -hmm. You know, that when you start repeating, it's like, okay, maybe, maybe it's, why are you making the same painting again? Are you making the same painting again? Uh, oh, I, how many eggs have I painted? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, yes and no. I mean, I think it's, to ask about like perfection, it's, it is this sort of s- absurd pursuit of some excellence of some resonance that is not, it's just not easy to achieve. No. And I, I'm sure some better painter, some better artist will have done it faster, but I, I can I can taste it. I'm almost there. I know. It's really interesting. What I'm thinking about right now as we're talking about this and, and answering these questions and this constant search for whatever that mystery is that we're trying to solve. You know, in the same way, sometimes the question to ask about the painting isn't what else does it need, but what should I take out? Yes. And I don't know if you're familiar with the artist Kurt Moyer, but I interviewed him um, I think it was a year ago already. I'm losing track of time. But we were kind of touching on a similar question, or maybe I was touching on it, and he just said something along the lines of, but, you know, some questions don't need to be answered. Right. Like, you can take it on faith and just move on. And that was a very calming and relaxing perspective. And so I find myself going back to that often. Like, does this question need to be answered? Is it the right question I should be asking? Right. I know for myself, it can be, I have to fight the urge to solve all the problems on the painting. Uh One of the favorite little puzzles I'll I'll give myself is I'll I'll look at a, a painting that I like, that I find remarkable, and I'll start sort of breaking it into pieces and going, you know what? I wouldn't, that corner of that Lucian Freud painting, it doesn't help this whole painting in any obvious way. And it needs, he should have done this. And I start realizing what I would have done differently. You're questioning Lucian Freud? I, well, I, you know, it's, it's, this is an exercise. But I'll, I'll see that. There's some, I do this. There's some, some paintings where like the way he's handled the floor, it, like it just, it doesn't make any sense. Right. It doesn't help the painting. But then I sort of go, well, what instinct do I have for that space? And would that have actually helped the painting? Of course it wouldn't have. Who do I think I am? And I, you know, you can do that with, I, I do that with a lot of different paintings. Like look at the, look at that spot on that Rembrandt to the side that's in the shadow that seems to have been forgotten or that, you know, the, the famous Velazquez, what's the portrait? I suddenly can't remember the name of it, where the, the hand is just this weird mollusk. It's oh. not a hand. It's just this strange blob. Right. That's not, that's not Las Meninas, is it? No. It's something different. I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah, I, you know, once you put it in the Spanish, I, I, yeah. And if he had rendered that hand more accurately, would that have actually made the painting better? No, it wouldn't have. But it's, it's so easy to get sucked into that sort of answering every little, every little problem, every little puzzle on a painting. And so I, I try hard to turn that part of my brain off and just focus in on a single subject, ignore the, the sort of the clutter of stuff. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. 
Jaquel Art Supplies started out by making high quality brushes here in California. They maintain close relationships with the artists who use their products, which enables Jaquel to serve their artists better. Greg Crayola Simpkins is a protein artist with Jaquel. Turns out, Greg and his father helped Turkel build a whole new product line. My dad was making my panels since I was like 18 and went through all the ups and downs of what materials we should be using. And my dad had a really good sense on what to do with those things. He was an engineer by career, but he was a carpenter for fun as a hobby at home. He always made stuff. And, you know, when Trakel wanted, we started talking to them about it. They're like, well, you know, maybe your dad will show us how he makes it. And they sat down and he took them to his workshop, to his garage. He took Ian over there and he just showed them what he did. And Ian took and enhanced on what my dad does or what my dad used to do. He doesn't make them anymore. He's gotten a little bit older. But Ian stepped up with my dad was doing even and made some really beautiful panels. And my dad's all excited to see what they've done. And I just thought to throw my dad a bone just to throw his name on the back of every panel. Like he used to put a branding mark on all my panels he made. So it said handcrafted by G.H. Simpkins, which is him. Everybody sees that and thinks it's me. I'm like, no, that's my dad. That's my dad's initials, George Henry Simpkins. And so Ian and, and Trakel, they put a, a little stamp for my dad on there, just out of respect for him and just sitting down with them. So it was like a little thing I wanted them to honor my dad with. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. Can you tell me, I'm curious, so we're talking about the egg paintings and, and some of this stuff, but is that, tell me what your... I hope this isn't a redundant question, but what what are you currently working on? What's your is it the eggs that you're currently obsessing on, or are you? There's sort of two. Uh, so there's two bodies of work. There's the there's sort of the. I think this is probably true of a lot of painters. There's the body of work that's actually happening on the easels, and there's the body of work happening in my head. Mm-hmm. And you know, hopefully they're the same thing. You know, sometimes they're not. And right now, so there's I do a lot of these the smaller paintings. I never thought I'd be working representationally. That was not what I thought was going to be my big arc in, as an art, as a painter, but it's sort of where I found myself. And I enjoy these small paintings. And and they and there is that story and the mystery and all the stuff that you want to have happen in a painting. And because of their scale, they're you know I can reach for the brass ring, but it's a smaller ring and it's a little closer. What size are you painting it? So the the egg paintings are usually quite small. I mean, they're often just ten by twelve inches. Mm-hmm eight by nine inches or so. And then there's some larger pieces. I do some architectural houses and buildings that are usually falling apart to some extent or another. But I've got a series of work in my head, some that I've started on that are, and I know I keep touching on this, but are about our story and our experiences with our daughter and what we went through Mm -hmm. with her and trying to relay that through some imagery, allegory, metaphor, et cetera. And it's, I haven't quite, got a grip on how I'm going to do it. It's a step outside of beyond what I've been doing. And I've, I've done you know, the one, there's a painting of mine called Crucible, where there's a, there's a figure emerging out of a, a doorway. And that's part of that series. And I'm trying to figure out how to sort of hint at a story, tell a story, but not make it so either exclusive. And this is true of, I guess, any of the things. Make them personal, but not let them be exclusive. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that somebody has to know who I am to want to look at them at all or so exclusive that somebody can't find their own story in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There has to be, yeah, I think a certain amount of foreignness, maybe curiosity, something unfamiliar, and then enough familiarity that the viewer has something to stand on. Yes. I think a lot about a painting as I'm working on it. I've thought a lot about why people respond to different pieces, but I don't know that I have an answer to why. I mean, it's, it's, I've been very fortunate that for whatever reason, some people have found the work to be of interest. And I, I keep coming back to how, uh, and this is sort of the myth making of art making, uh, that, uh, how social this process is making a painting is just, you know, it's what humans do. We are storytelling species. And mm-hmm. we, this is one of the things that we do. I you know that the cave paintings, on up through Rembrandt and everything else. Mm. This is just a very natural activity. And when I have a someone come to the studio, I mean, I, I think of one particular incident where this a woman came to the was here for the open studio tour, and 
she was here with some friends and they asked about some paintings and they said they're going to come back the next day. And the one woman who had actually not said anything came and said, you know, they said they were going to buy those paintings. They're not buying anything, but I'm going to buy that painting. If you tell me the story of that painting, because I'd hinted at it the next day, but I didn't want to go into too much. And it was a, a, a little painting of a house. I'm rambling a bit, I know. I love it. Uh, it was a little painting of a house that was sort of on fire, but not, uh, you know, you couldn't tell if it was, and it was a very simple painting and I, I made it very quickly and you couldn't tell if it was a house that was being consumed or reborn or I, I'm not sure. And I, it was one of the first, and it's, you know, it's 24 by 24, so it's not a big piece, but it was one of the first pieces I'd made after our daughter was born that was a little bit more to there was a little bit more to it and i told her the story of of jane and this painting and where it came from and she's got tears in her eyes you know these are uh the three women were empty nesters and they've got kids and they've got you know tell a story about a kid in a hospital and you can make people cry pretty quickly oh yeah she was just like okay i'm gonna buy it and let me tell you why and she shared her story of some pain and loss in her family that she had seen in this painting herself, that she was at a point in transition in her life that, you know, again, was she, was this a rebirth for her? Was her house burning down? Was it coming back together? She wasn't sure. And it was that kind of exchange that, that social exchange was the, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily what starts the impulse to make a painting, but it is certainly an important part of this thing that we do, at least for me. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that's, we're storytellers, like we respond and react and get emotionally involved with stories. Like even if you think of the cave paintings, you know, they were communicating things about their daily life that moved them. Like I was just watching recently, there's a documentary is um, Herner, uh, Werner Herzog. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There we go. Herner. Uh, I can't even do it. Um, on on the cave paintings in France and I mean they're phenomenal. Like you I think of cave paintings as being very rustic and very yeah, just very rustic and very kind of like childlike in a sense. And these were yeah. exquisite drawings and very accurate and very detailed. And if you think about it during that time period, like language wasn't as well developed as it is now. And and they were using that as a way to communicate or at least express their own emotions. And I don't know how, I guess like paintings are communication. They are storytelling, whether it's hitting you over the head with it and very literal or, or not. But I think every painting tells a story about something. Yes. And that's one of the sort of arguments I've had with some painters who have said, oh, you know, it doesn't matter what you paint. It's how you paint it. And I, I've said the same thing at some point in, in my career. And I'm like, you know, I have really decided that's, at least for myself, not true at all. Almost anything you make is going to have references to this this human experience that we have, that we share. Yeah. You can't not do that. And you know, even when you just arrange those objects, supposedly because of their the way their shape, shapes line up and stuff, you still chose specific objects. You still made a specific arrangement that you either connect to and or your audience is going to connect to. It's There's going to be a story there. Painting is, it's storytelling, it's investigation, it's self-flagellation. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> its such a peculiar pursuit. It's just... It really is. <laughs> I mean, I, I love it and I hate it. It is, and I wouldn't, I don't know, I, I was going to say something glib about how I wouldn't have it any other way, but I'm sure... You know, there's that, what's that that old idea of, do you want a, a, a meaningful life or a happy life? Right. And I'm definitely much more interested in a meaningful life, even though that's going to be, there are going to be some scars and broken bones along the way. Yep. I'm bummed because it's already been an hour and I feel like I should let you go, but I have like enjoyed I, this You know, I'm, I, and I realize that I don't want to give you 37 hours to edit here. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to talk about this stuff forever. I mean, I was just like, you know, leading up to this, I've been doing this anyway. Uh, is this, and I, I know I keep bringing back to it, but like Jane, our daughter's seven years old. And it was really hard to get any work done for a long time. I mean, sitting at the easel with a mountain resting on my back, trying not to just freak out at what we were going through, what she's going through, what the future holds for us. And in the middle of all that going, I'm going to relax. 
and be focused <laughs> and pay attention to this flat square in front of me and make something beautiful. I mean, it's just, it. How did you do that? I mean, like, I can't, artists write to me and say, you know, like, how do people manage this, manage painting with a kid? And a very, very close friend of mine had special needs kids. They were twins. And, and he went through, I mean, I can't, I, who did not go through it, can barely talk about it without crying. It was traumatic. And there was, like you're saying, you have a mountain on your shoulder. How did you continue to paint during that time? Like when you, you mentioned, you kind of alluded to this before saying that it, that your daughter made your painting or in some sense feel inconsequential, right? It's some, yes. I'm paraphrasing. Very insignificant. Insignificant. Yes. Yeah, no. And if I'm asking you two personal questions. No, um, no. To me, this is, is to, to go back to the nuts and bolts questions about managing career. This is, to me, this is part of the sincerity. It's like, if, if our experiences with Jane is part of the story of the paintings, why would I not tell that story? And why would I not tell that story? And this, uh, this sounds like something out of a bad interview of some actor. Like, if I could help one person. No, no. <laughs> there are so many people that have gone through similar and worse. And it is not something that has been talked about with enough intelligence. Right. There are people who are telling it with just great, incisive writers or being an artist, uh, but I don't think it's been talked about quite enough. That again, there's this sort of this, I'll just go to the work. I'll go to my my office and I will make paintings and I'll work nine to five. And this is this is what you do. And I would just, I'd go out and I'd, I'd try to paint and I'd try to bury myself, hide in the painting to some extent. Anytime you're making a painting, at least anytime, again, I always want to say, anytime I'm making a painting, what I want to have happen is that I want it to go from being an intellectual exercise to go past just scratching an itch to to the point that it becomes a little obsessive act where I have to just just get to that spot where it resonates. Mm -hmm. And it was all the more critical, harder to do, but all the more critical when we were going through what we were going through. Because if I could get to that spot, I could forget, maybe only for an hour, mm -hmm. that it may or may not be my daughter's last day. That if I could just do this, then of course, then I might make a good painting and, and might get some nice tummy rubs, pats on the head because it was a nice thing and maybe somebody would buy it and that would take care of some, some other stresses. And I just, I, I tried to focus, not always, often not successfully, on that it was my responsibility to make paintings, which is part of why I said earlier that I would sort of set a deadline of, okay, you've got three months mm -hmm. to get X number of pieces done or make X number of sales. And it was my job, which is, you know, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, so I'm trying right now to put myself in, you know, like as difficult as it is in the sense that like, I cannot fathom what you guys went through. And so when I say I'm trying to put myself in your position, I feel like I'm a little bit like a squirrel trying to understand why somebody would paint. So it's it's with that admitted ignorance and inability to <laughs> to put myself in a situation where I cannot even comprehend what it must have been like. But if you feel like you're and again, I just want to, you know, if you don't want to answer this question, please don't and don't feel bad about it. But if you're in this situation with your daughter and you're feeling like this might perhaps be her last day, how could you possibly paint? Well, there's two answers to that. When things were at their most dire, I wasn't painting. I mean, I, I simply wasn't. I mean, there were there were months where I didn't. It was just not an option. But the other part of it is that you know, life goes on, and this sounds so glib. She's seven years old now, and every parent, almost every parent, checks on their kid to see if they're sleeping, mm -hmm. or will even joke like, "Oh, I checked to see if they're still breathing." Mm -hmm. We check on our daughter every single night, and we are checking to see if she's still alive. And okay, I'm not going to cry. Okay, <laughs> neither am I. And <laughs> and you know that's every day it is it's life and we can't we can't not still live our lives to some extent or not even as best we can i mean it wouldn't it doesn't help her to have a miserable father and she's had a miserable father because you know these kinds of stresses they do take their toll you still have to do things you still have to work you still have to pay the bills you still have to be yourself 
you still have to find, I mean, again, these things seem so glib, but you still have to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. And as I keep joking about the compulsion to, to make things, I'm a happier person when I'm with any margin of success making things. And that's whether it's painting or building a rock wall in the garden. Like mm-hmm. the, that satisfaction is necessary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it, it, this is one of the challenges that I often have when I'm talking to other people about the artwork and what I'm doing. And again, I, I know that I'm not. I'm painting little eggs off and I'm not doing big, massive, culture-bearing pieces that are going to lurch the, the world forward. But, you know, there's big, heavy stuff, at least for us, going on. Of course. And I think the, the most memorable things are the, the small little moments that at that time might seem inconsequential. And yet those are the things that you remember most fondly. Those are the things that you look back on that I think that there's very few like gigantic pivotal moments in our lives that are super, super meaningful. I want to ask you though, if I can, if you would, do you mind giving some context for people? Because I guarantee you that there are people out there who maybe have a similar situation or, but if you don't mind, can you talk about what happened to your daughter? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I won't go into too tight of specifics, but so she's seven years old, turned seven this past January. I should preface all of these things by what would seem obvious, but is really true for her that she's this amazing, giggly, remarkable child that, you know, parents have a bias, but this, this is true. You can ask the other parents. She makes the, the children and the adults around her better. It is amazing to watch how you know, little kids being the bratty little monsters that they can be, uh, including our kid, of course, how when she's in the classroom, when she's with her friends, they become this mass of hugs and love. And it is just so beautiful to see. She was, uh, we didn't know about any issues before she was born. And when she was a couple days old, a doctor came in and you think about how a doctor usually says you may feel some minor discomfort, you know, how they downplay everything. Mm -hmm. And he came in with his eyes wide and his hands shaking. So he is scared and tells us that your daughter needs to be transferred over to this local hospital and she's going to have, need to have open heart surgery immediately. And so she has her cardiac issue, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And there's a three prescribed surgeries, one at basically as soon as they can manage. She had her first open heart surgery when she was eight days old. Her heart's you know, the size of a, you know, the last digit of your thumb or maybe a walnut. I, I can't remember the exact scale, but impossibly small. And there's a, you know, they give you the percentages of the chances of survival of that first surgery. And then there's the next surgery in six months or so. And there's that six month stretch where all you're doing is trying to keep the child alive, measuring weights and feeding tubes. And and we were remodeling our house at the same time. So really good time. <laughs> Oh my God, a little Scott. bit of stress. It was, as I said, we didn't know about her right, medical right. issues. So, you know, we already had the mistiming of like, kid's going to arrive and you didn't get the remodel done as quickly as planned. And So was she preemie? Uh, she was not premature. It was an ideal pregnancy in many okay. ways. No idea that there were any issues. I mean, she was, knew that she was going to be small. My wife is you know, five foot and a half inch. So we didn't, we didn't know really anything. Not really. We didn't know anything. We assumed that it was going to be a perfectly typical child. And then there's a third surgery, and that was originally scheduled for three and a half or four years of age. And, and they revise the cardiac system so that it, it doesn't function like it does in you and I. She started to, I'm telling you, maybe more than you wanted to know. She started to struggle when she was, I'm, I get the years off at this point. It's all quite blurry because you need sleep to form memories. You do. And we didn't get a whole lot of sleep for a long time. There was a summer of oxygen tanks. Her cardiologist at one point saying that she might not be able to have the third surgery. And we asked, well, what does that mean? And he's like, well, you enjoy her while you can. <laughs> <laughs> so she, they did, she had some relatively minor procedure, things she got a little stronger, a little more stable. She had the third surgery and she's got some communication and motor difficulties, mm-hmm. but she's, she's a first grader. And she's, by every measure, she's thriving. We, without going to particulars, we don't know what the future holds. 
they've only been doing these surgeries for a couple decades or so. And, you know, there's, there are all these percentages, like the first surgery, the others, a 82% or something like that chance of survival. And the second surgery is this percent chance mm. and chance between the surgeries, this, and, and you, you know, each one you're like, well, not ideal, but okay. But if you know how probabilities work, you start doing the math and you go, I don't want to do the math. Let's mm. just see how it goes. So it's, yeah, it is the experience that has colored everything. And it has, it's easy to say that it's made the, the painting seem inconsequential, mm-hmm. but it's, it's also given the work, well, a meaning and more purpose. There's a sort of narcissistic noodling that can easily happen, especially if you, if you have any sort of easy talent for painting. And I had some, not as much as I wanted, certainly, but I had some where it's like, hey, I make this and it looks good and people say nice things. Isn't it great? And it suddenly becomes much more important when you've gone through and are going through what some of what we've gone through. But again, she's, she's just the happiest, funniest kid. She's just, she's tremendous. We've never met in person, and this is the first time we're talking, but we are Facebook friends, and I've seen pictures of her, and she does have like this joy about her that is very, very noticeable. She is a beguiling, charming little kid who has her demands, and she will get them met somehow, (laughs) usually with a smile. (laughs) Wizard of Oz. And you're like, does that mean you want to watch Wizard of Oz? Yes. You're like, okay. Right, let's watch Wizard of Oz again. <laughs> let's go see we Dorothy. <laughs> yes. Let's see Dorothy and the lion hair and Kovic. Yes. You hope every parent loves their kid. She has certainly earned ours. No doubt. Do you feel like art has been a I feel like I'm asking a really dumb question right now. Maybe another way of saying this <laughs> is it sounds to me like art has been a very your art has been a very healing force in your life. Could you talk a little bit about that? Like how that has manifested itself? I don't know that I have an answer to that. As you know, it's uh, the, and this is uh, maybe this is what I've taken out of a lot of our experiences and and what where painting is for me is that I'm an artist. I don't have a choice. It's just who I am. And if it is healing at all, it is that I have been forced to recognize that and just, you know, not always successfully, but try to embrace it. And rather than sort of wrestling with, I mean, I, I, I am Lord King of angst, so I won't even say that I'm not going to wrestle with the demons because it's, you know, that's to me that that is part, a big part of the process. I don't know that it's been healing at all. <laughs> um, Boom. Okay. So I always try to ask questions that aren't leading or try not to assume that I already know the answer or phrase it in a way that would seem that way. So just having broken my own rule and saying like, okay, I'm just going to say like, so art sounds like it's been really, no, actually it's not been healing. (laughs) No, it's, it's been awful. Why did I choose this career? Wouldn't it, you know, I should ask my wife if she thinks it's been healing for me at all. Cause I, I, there's the painting I did before my daughter was born, and there's the painting I've done since she was born. There's the career I had before, the career I've had since. When she arrived, it was around the same time, of course, of the last recession when the galleries I'd worked with, pretty much all of them had either closed up or had to do some significant roster changes or something. So I have, in a sense, been building a new career since Jane was born, partly because you know there, I, I couldn't meet obligations. Mm -hmm. You've got a show, you've got, uh, you know, when I was say doing some design work, there's a deadline, like, sorry, I can't, I just, and everyone was fantastic. You know, if there was a lesson that I, and I, we were really wandering off, off uh, the plan here, but if there was the thing that I've taken from our experiences, it is that it's just, and this sounds so cheesy, but how much good there is in this world, Mm. how many people we have connected with and who have reached out and offered support, either just kind words or food showing up from strangers. You know, that there was a, someone that I knew who knew somebody who shared the story, and there's a church in Oklahoma that sent us a small check. Oh my and God. I'm not a person of, I'm not a person of faith, but, you know, that, that these kinds of things were happening. It's like, how? I didn't know this is the way the world worked. I mean, I, I have the easy cynicism of anybody that has watched too much news and read too much stuff on the internet. And you, you see people just being so kind over and over and over again. It's just, it's kind of hard to ignore. And I, 
I do have to remember that, especially as we've going through what we are going through in our political climate. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what well, I know. I come back to again, like the, you know, the, I'm, I keep thinking about how has it been healing? It's the, the, the painting since she was born and the realities of our life with her have dictated that I be more dedicated to this as an endeavor than I needed to be beforehand. After we talked, Scott felt he wasn't completely honest with the answer he gave about whether or not his art is healing. He emailed to see if he could change his answer, and a few weeks later, we talked again. So I've included both answers because I think each is honest and authentic. So you had asked me uh, if I had found art painting this pursuit healing. You know, it helps us heal from as we'd come out of these, the, the worst of these difficulties. And I'd hemmed and hawed and said no. And, and I just couldn't shake the question. And I realized that I was wrong, that the answer was yes. And that to some extent, the reason that I'd said no and that, and that what I'd said in other parts of the conversation wasn't necessarily accurate or was incomplete and not because of time constraints, but because, because I'd become so accustomed to a particular story and narrative you know, we'd gotten so used to carrying this mountain around that it had become, even if it wasn't how we lived our lives and how I necessarily worked when I was in the studio, that when someone asked me any of those questions, and you weren't the first necessarily to ask, ask that question, that I gave that old answer. And that was coloring a lot of my other perceptions as well. Your perceptions during the conversation or in, in your studio? Everything, maybe. As I, I think I wrote to you that there was a sort of a little bit of an epiphany. And it may not seem like an epiphany to anybody else, but it certainly felt that way to me. I think for a lot of artists or some of the artists that I've talked to, and I, I talked to some folks recently about this exact thing, the studio, you know, it's a place of work and it's an office, but it's also a sanctuary. You know, you close the door and regular life is on one side and your art life is on the other side. And, you know, you've the sort of the demons, the imps, and the angels of your life, never mind the taxes, the laundry that needs to be folded and all that, you sort of lock it out. And you let in the pieces, or at least I think I tried to do this before, I'd let in the pieces that I thought would fuel or inspire painting or give me an excuse to make a particular painting. And that when I shut that door, those, and and it's a clumsy metaphor, but the, the angels and those monsters and all that, you could still hear them. Regular life was, I mean, it was still there, but it was sort of like the weather. You'd close the door, you know it was raining, but it's not like it was raining inside the studio. But when you go through something like what we went through, and again, others have and are obviously going through so much more than we went through and have gone through. But when you go through something like that, those beasts, they just become so massive and so powerful and so loud. And it's like there's a mob at the door. And so as you're trying to, as I'm trying to do that sort of old idea of the studio as sanctuary and just the workplace, just the office, and there's that cacophony, I couldn't work. And it made working harder. It was like trying to paint while I had my shoulder against the door to keep somebody from breaking in. And they really wanted to come in. And again, it made it harder. And it isn't as hard today. And which is, of course, what spurs the question of like, was this all healing and such? And, and I, my instinct is to say no, because when I think of art in terms of healing, I think of it in terms of therapy and what it might be for <laughs> civilians, for people for whom art isn't, doesn't occupy so much of their life. There's been a lot of healing. And some of that is, of course, because Jane is, despite whatever difficulties, that she is a happy, thriving joyous little child. But some is because I had no choice but to let the monsters and the angels in and sort of say, pull up a chair, let's paint together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I mean, they're not always good painters. I mean, they make horrible paintings sometimes and, and they ruin otherwise good paintings. But I had no choice but to stop trying to control them in a way that I could when they were, you know, smaller little angels and imps that lived outside. Right. And this is the part that keeps ringing through my head. I hope I'm not rambling here. It's like the part that keeps ringing through my head is that when I let those monsters in, this, maybe this all sounds very cliched and monsters make great stories. And I think there's a tendency for, for artists, certainly today to want to only let the monsters into the studio so they can make something that's, you know, got some real weight and has some bite to it. But when I let them in and sort of open that door and let the barrier between this workspace, this career and life become more porous that 
I also let the joy in, let the angels in. And I think that, I think that's actually a good bit of what's been happening in the work. And it's certainly what happens in, in our life with our child, but it's not necessarily what I express to others when they ask about what we've been through and they ask about the work that I just instinctively talk more about the heavy mountain that we've had to carry and not as much about I just I how how much it has transformed how I see everything. Right. I don't know. Does that make any sense? I mean this is it really does feel like a bit of an epiphany for me like, holy crap. Well it actually it does it it makes a lot of on, on a such a small smaller scale it makes a lot of sense to me in in terms of like this is you know something that i talk about often with with other artists just in the sense of the inner critic and how that can always be sort of messing with your head and sometimes you have to say like okay you have to stay outside right now but you know i'll make room for you later but right now you can't be in here but at some point you have to invite it in because it's not going to go away no and i think on a much obviously grander scale it's kind of like what you're talking about like whatever's going on in our lives has a tendency to want to come into the studio and we sort of have to be the guardians of the gate and and then that whole concept of you can't separate the angels and the demons or the angels and the monsters like they kind of come hand in hand and you want to i mean as you're saying like the guardian of the gate that you try to filter which ideas and which impulses are the ones that are going to come into the work. And what's so sort of peculiar to me about me wanting to give the answer of no to your question, your original question is that, and I don't know if others see this, but when I'm painting, whatever I'm painting, to some extent, I'm trying hard to not let myself fall too much into a system, not fall too much into an expectation of this is the way it's going to be. So that, that I would do that in other aspects of how I think about the work or the studio or my life it just seems very peculiar to me <laughs> that it's like, why, why would I do that there, but not over there? So it's, uh, I'm coming out of, as I mentioned earlier, a weekend of art and an art opening and being around everybody from Daniel Sprick to Kwang Ho to Elia Elbermani and, and all these other folks doing such tremendous work. I don't know. This is just, this is a, I think a point of pivot in my life and uh, in this, this work. And so thank you for that. You're very welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we get in we get so deep inside of our own heads that sometimes just either if somebody's asking you a question or forcing yourself to write things down makes you stop and think. Whereas, you know, oftentimes we want to shove it aside or we have more, you know, or there's more important things happening that you don't really have time to think about that. Yes. That it sort of makes sense that I mean, to me, it makes total sense that not just me, but anyone asking you that question and kind of forcing you to stop and think about it a little bit and reassess it, even if, you know, like, because my instinct always, at least, you know, when people ask, no matter what's going on, like I've had people close to me die, I've had everybody has their own things that they go through and my typical response, Oh no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, like you just, right. <laughs> you like either. And I don't know, sometimes I just didn't want to talk about it. And sometimes maybe I wasn't ready to talk about it, but you know, you kind of just, and sometimes it's this weird feeling like for me, at least, you know, my brother passed away and after, after he died, everybody was always, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And after a while, you just like, I at least got sick of that question. <laughs> You know, it's just like, no, I'm not, but I, we'll carry on. And it, it, I always wonder what motivates some of those questions. I mean, sometimes it's not to go back to monsters and demons and such, but I, I think because I'm not a person who is a person of faith or, or has much belief in the supernatural, but the it's almost like when people would ask us how our daughter's doing, sometimes I think they were asking, tell me that this stuff isn't really happening. Right. Or tell me something so that I know that it won't ever happen to me. Like right. I need, I need my get out of jail card. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that's, that's exactly it. And I, I, I'd gotten, I mean, I think we all do this. We get so used to telling the same stories and I have been, you know, whether it's in social media or in real life, I've been rewarded for being, and I'm trying to not do air quotes here, uh, being honest and genuine and open. But if you, give the same answer enough times and you get rewarded for that answer that start you sort of start steering towards that rather than necessarily stopping and being 
actually honest about right. what you're experiencing. And I think that's, you know, and, and to bring it back to painting, I think that's certainly one of the battles we all have with painting is that we get the little pat on the head for working a particular way. Yep. And, and that may not, may or may not actually be what's you should be making. Right. Right. There's a big difference between, I mean, at, at a certain point, some answers become almost automatic and when they do, and you're not thinking about them anymore, then that's kind of the equivalent of finding the formula for painting the perfect yes. tree or table or whatever it is. Step and just one, reusing that over. Yeah. Step one. Step, step two, one, use step, burnt umber. Step yes. two, draw with this size pencil. And it's like, you know, and then that starts becoming a conversation of the difference between art and craft, perhaps. Art being the, the constantly trying not to sit too much on your assumptions of how you make something. Scott, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us and for being so open and candid. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Yes, a pleasure. So just as Scott felt that his answer about the healing aspects of art was incomplete, I just can't shake the feeling that our conversation about how people deal with trauma and grief was left incomplete as well. There are no rules to our experiences as human beings. We're often messy and complicated and awkward. But I think Scott's observation was dead on. Underneath it all, there's always kindness, caring, and love for each other. And I know how that sounds, especially these days. It might seem... Pollyanna-ish, it might seem over-optimistic, it might even seem like a completely radical idea. But behind the awkward questions, our own discomfort when we see someone else in pain or experiencing trauma, behind the inadequate words we use to try to comfort each other is the sincere desire to just make it all better. We see someone carrying a mountain on their shoulders and we want to take the load off, but we can't because it's not our load to bear. And that right there is the beautiful thing about human beings, because even when we know it's impossible, we still try. We show up with food, we give hugs, we write checks to people we've never met. We ask, are you okay? Even when we know the answer is no. We make awkward jokes and we hope for even the slightest smile. But the truth is we can't make it all better. And as much as we want to, we can't carry the load, but we can walk alongside of each other. And it does help and it does matter. So thank you again, Scott, for sharing so much of yourself with us. Thank you for sharing your story and your art. Go to SavvyPainter.com for the show notes on this episode. You can see Scott's paintings, get links to his workshops, and connect with him on Facebook. Until next week, this is Antrees Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 